Hello and welcome back to the Chaos Ball Podcast, everyone. This is episode 50, the 50th episode of the Mariners Podcast on the known internet. Thank you all for those of you who've listened from the beginning. Shout out to y'all. And for those of you who I've picked up during the season, which there are some of you out there listening right now that... You know, maybe you didn't go back and listen to the first episodes. I wouldn't. The audio quality is not great. We've come a long way in that department. Uh, and it really doesn't feel like 50 episodes. I, I could do this. I could do this every day. And and it wouldn't even feel like anything. I love I love talking about managed baseball, but baseball as a whole. And I love the feedback that my friends give me about this podcast. And it means a lot that you all continue to listen and hello to any new listeners, if this is your first episode. Sometimes it happens. There are new listeners every episode, it feels like. But, all in all, the mood is bad today. The mood is not great. It is Sunday. Only a few few minutes after the Mariners just feigned a comeback against the Rangers. I'll get into that series in a little bit, but what am I going to talk about today in episode 50? I don't have anything special planned for this episode because it coincides with the most dramatic and crucial point in the Mariners season, and so there's so much to talk about. There's so much to muse over. There's so many things that could happen in the next week that will change our collective mood for the entire month of October, but what I will be talking about I'm not really going to be recapping the A's series. I'll go over it briefly. Uh, But I'll be talking about the no good, very bad Rangers series that just happened. I'm going into a little bit of Ty France. I've looked at the numbers. I am ready to talk about Ty France. And this is the Ty France diagnosis episode. Uh, The Modesto Nuts did something cool. Luis Castillo. There's a cool set about Luis Castillo. And then, of course... My random weekly notes, which I debuted last week, to um, to a, a crowd that that appreciated my weekly notes. I I I need to write things down more. I think of so many things, and I'm really starting to write them down a lot more, so I can share them with you all. And it is truly my pleasure to share what goes on in the brain of mine on a weekly basis, either when I'm watching baseball. Sometimes when it's like 1 a.m. and I can't sleep and I just write stuff down in my notes app about baseball. But it's a light weekly notes week this week just because I was super focused on on some other things and busy with with other stuff that didn't involve baseball. And genuinely, the Mariners made me a little sad and I didn't have as many notes when I'm sad. So let's just get into it. The Mariners right now, as we sit here and you listen potentially on Monday before they take on the Houston Astros. They are three games out of the AL West lead. They are a half game behind the Astros in second place, who are two and a half back of the Rangers now. Rangers sitting in very good position on a win five uh, going into the final week of the season. They're probably feeling pretty good about their playoff chances and the Mariners. It's it's reflective the division lead and the wild card lead. They're a half game back of the third wild card spot. Half game back of the Houston Astros. Toronto is two games ahead of the Astros, which makes them two and a half ahead of the Seattle Mariners. And the Tampa Bay Rays and the Orioles have not slowed down. The Rays are nine and a half up of the in the first wild card spot right now, and uh, two and a half games behind the Baltimore Orioles for the lead in the AL East. It's looking like the Orioles might take that division, and the Rays will be the number one wild card spot, but we'll see what happens when things are all said and done next week. So, what did the Mariners do? Uh, it was a fairly somber podcast recording last week because they had won the Angels series after a tough Rays road trip, and then the Dodgers come to town, sweep the hell out of them, and I hop on the pod and uh, I'm like, hey, well, this isn't great. They probably should have won a game or two against the Dodgers. That would have been nice, very winnable games. Uh, But then I dubbed the Oakland A's series in Oakland midweek as the most important series of the year. I dubbed it a must-sweep. I said, up until this point, this is the most important series because they have to sweep 
to even have a chance at the playoffs, just especially because the Oakland A's are so bad. And they did that. They listened to my podcast and they said, okay, we'll win. We'll win just for you. And they did. They won 5-0, 7-2, and 6-3. I don't have much to say about this series. I could get into why they won, but they won. They were the superior team to the Oakland Athletics. And they absolutely throttled them this season. The Mariners took care of business against the Oakland A's this year. Winning the season series in the new scheduling format of only 13 games against divisional opponents... 12-1 to 1 this year against the Oakland A's. Really, really great to see. That was, I believe, uh, one of the big, big things that I highlighted before the season as a must-accomplishment. Wow, that was a terrible, terrible sentence. I apologize. That was It was kind of a must-have this year. Going into the year that we knew the A's would be pretty basement-dwelling in the league, and I think I highlighted that they're just going to need to beat them a lot. It's pretty essential to just pad those wins. In a time like this, when they're needing more wins than ever, they sweep the A's and go 12-1 and over the season against them. So thankfully they handled business there because I could have seen this going sour and them losing a couple games to the A's, which they should have won. And, and if looking back on the season and if... They make the playoffs if they don't make the playoffs. No matter what happens, we can at least say the Mariners are better than the Oakland A's. You know, we can hang our hats on that. Am I right? No, I'm moving on. Not much else from that series. I really don't have much else to say. Uh, Oakland, man. I mean, the offense honestly has been a little zesty the past month because of all the young guys in it. The pitching still real bad, and those young fellows have uh, have shown some some good flashes. We saw Zach Geloff home, homer in this series. He's looking like a piece. They're looking like they have some good young guys, but just, you know, it's flashes from young guys and the rest of it is just yeah, still just real bad. Still just real real bad. And then the Mariners get an off day. They get an off day to travel to Texas to play the Rangers, a team that has been the boogeyman for them this year. The Rangers have really handled the Mariners, especially in this new barbecue, Home Depot, warehouse-looking-ass stadium they built. I miss the old Globe Life field. I feel like the Mariners succeeded wildly in that field, particularly because of Kyle Seeger, maybe. But I just miss the, I miss, miss, miss the old Globe Life, especially after the series we just saw. One of the more unlucky series I have ever seen this year. Maybe ever. I Definitely recency bias, but they played pretty poorly for most of this series and also got supremely unlucky at every turn, it felt like. Just an awful series. At such a crucial time. At such a crucial time, they put together a stinker of a series against... A divisional opponent they're vying for a playoff spot against it one of like again one of the more unlucky stretches of three games I've ever seen like nothing was going their way you couple that with just playing poorly it's just a, a recipe for a very very bad sweep and that is precisely what happened Friday they go in and they lose this game 8-5. to five. Bryce Miller gets rocked for six runs over four innings in this game. The Mariners end up getting four off Dane Dunning, but they they really should have gotten more. They had Dane Dunning, Jordan Montgomery, and then uh, Nate Eovaldi today. And the Dunning and Eovaldi starts, they both put up runs. Today they put up a lot. They probably should have put up more against Dane Dunning. He's been pretty bad recently. Uh, Jordan Montgomery has been really good. If any game they were going to lose 2-0, to zero, I I would have expected it to be the Jordan Montgomery game. But the way they did it was crazy. But back to this Friday game. I mean, the offense didn't look that bad. The offense did not really look that bad. Uh, this one, they really just fell kind of short. They They caught some unlucky breaks, but I think this was more 
um, the Rangers just being the better team in this game. The Mariners' offense did not take advantage of Dane Dunning as much as I would have liked, as I said. And the Rangers just torched uh, Bryce Miller's pitches when he put a fastball in the zone. It's not super difficult. Uh, This Rangers team is quite good at punishing uh, bad pitches. Every pitcher throws some bad pitches in a game, and the Rangers just seem like a team that can really, really hurt you in that regard, particularly because they just barrel balls pretty well. They're just a barreling kind of team. They hit a lot of home runs. They have a lot of hard hits. And they've got a lot of dogs in this lineup. It's a very tough lineup to get through, especially even twice. To get through twice, it appears quite tough. And to even try to go through it three times is is brutal. They're just, they wear you down. And they, they make your mistake pitches haunt you. And this one was just, it was not good vibes going into this, this game. I mean, Cal Raleigh had a home run, I guess. Kelnick had four walks and a hit. He had a really nice game. He's looking... A lot more composed at the plate. Uh, Gino had two hits. Gino actually looked better this series than he has. Uh, but unfortunately, it was just not enough after Bryce Miller and Saucedo gave up eight runs. Uh, and that was kind of it. That was kind of it in this game. And then we go to, to game two. We go to game two on Saturday. It's Jordan Montgomery versus Logan Gilbert. It's set up to be a pitcher's duel. And you look at the box score and you say, oh, yeah, no, it was a pitcher's duel. It was two to zero. Two to zero. The Mariners have six hits, no runs. The Rangers have seven hits and no runs. And this game was preposterous. This one felt like a loss from the start. It was call it Babip luck, call it I don't know, hit it hit it hard, put it in play, and uh You don't get rewarded for it. Call it cursed. Call it um, this stadium in Arlington, Texas sucks eggs. I, I couldn't... I watched this entire game start to finish. And from like the onset, I knew they were going to lose. It just felt like one of those. It was a, it was a phantom pitcher's duel because each team... The Mariners had 10 hard hits, and the Rangers had 13 hard hits. I'm just, I'm going to go through the Savant page of this game in terms of exit velocity and run it through. Dylan Moore, 106 mile an hour double. That was a home run in 21 of 30 ballparks. Straightaway center, hits the yellow tape. Three inches up. And this is probably over the fence on a home run. Tough break. Brutal break. Cal Raleigh. 105 mile an hour ground out. Sure. 590 expected batting average on that one. Luis Torrens. 104 mile an hour ground ground out. 600 expected batting average on that one. Julio. 104 mile an hour double. Absolutely. Uh, hit it really hard. Really far. Sure. Teoscar Hernandez, fielder's choice ground, fielder's choice out, 103 miles an hour off the bat, 5'10 expected batting average. Cal Raleigh, 101 mile an hour fly out, 6'10 expected batting average, home run in 16 of 30 ballparks. Really good play in center field to get that one, but that was, it was the following inning after the Dylan Moore almost home run, and I think that was my mental breaking point. Uh, Teoscar Hernandez, 98 mile an hour single. Ty France, 98 mile an hour single. Ty France actually had a pretty decent series, I'll say himself. Despite not getting that many hits, he was hitting the ball pretty hard. Ty France, 97 mile an hour line out. Uh, Jose Caballero, 96 mile an hour ground out. Sam Haggerty, 96 mile an hour ground out. Gino, 96 mile an hour line out. J.P. Crawford, 95 mile an hour ground out. It was a game of oh oh like they hit the ball oh and it's an out just backbreaker after backbreaker and then you go down the line and you're like what hmm where did the rangers runs come from by chance they also hit the ball pretty hard they also got pretty unlucky nathaniel low their hardest hit ball of the game 105.5 miles an hour ground into a double play Corey Seager, 105 mile an hour single. 
Evan Carter, 104 mile an hour double. Evan Carter, 102 mile an hour ground out. You go down the line, they hit the ball pretty hard. They had some similar similar luck on their hard hit balls as the Mariners. Not that many of them fell for hits, and none of them were RBI hits or even super crucial hits in the late game. Both teams got fairly unlucky because of that stuff. And then you look down the line, where did the RBIs come from? Mitch Garver, 65.8 mile an hour single. And Jonah Heim, 63.2 mile an hour single. It was the second inning Mitch Garver single that dribbled down the first baseline that I knew the Mariners were going to lose that one. I don't even know if I can fault Ty France for that. He was playing away from the bag, and even a really good first baseman still probably has to dive for that one. And do they make the play every time? Probably not. That's a really tough one. If Ty France was faster, would he have knocked the ball down? Maybe. Either way, doesn't matter. Doesn't change what happened. Two super soft hit RBIs and the the Jonah Heim one was just a bloop single in the outfield and bada bing bada boom those are your two runs and you lose you look at the Savant page again Rangers two runs on seven hits with a 214 expecting batting average as a team the Mariners zero runs on six hits 297 expecting batting average it was just one of those games the Rangers were never even in danger of losing this one. Uh, the The Mariners were not. No matter what they did, they weren't going to, to win this one. They had, like, the Dylan Moore and Kyle Raleigh outs that would have been home runs in a lot of other ballparks, particularly the Dylan Moore one, was, man, it it could have been my Joker moment, that Dylan Moore one. And Dave Sims, of course, thought it was a home run. I'm not even going to fault him for that one. That one's not on him. I could not believe this game. No one on Twitter could believe this game. There were a lot of takes thrown out. I'll boil it down to they got screwed in this game, and yet they still could have done more to win. They were hitting the ball hard, They and yet they still they had some crucial strikeouts with men on base where the Rangers, with men on base, were managing to put the ball in play, i.e. Mitch Garver and Jonah Heim on their bloop singles, little dribbler singles, to win this game. Putting the ball in play helps in spots like that. And I feel like the Mariners have lacked situational hitting in that way this year in terms of uh, just putting the ball in play when they need to put the ball in play. Uh, It just feels like... A lot of the time, they can they can junk the ball up there, the pitchers, and, and the men's hitters will just swing at it. It's just felt like there's been a general lack of both a two-strike approach and situational hitting this year. And if they have slugged more than they have this year, if they were hitting a lot more home runs than they are, they're still hitting a decent amount, but... I I'm not I'm not happy with the way that they approach the plate with men on base. It just seems lackluster. It seems like there isn't really a hard approach that this team has shown they kind of have the past couple of years. I don't know. We saw it in the Dodgers series too, where there are men on base for the Dodgers and they don't they grind out every plate appearance that team. It's part of their DNA. That team gets on base, they put in good plate appearances, they're really well coached, and they put the ball in play. And putting the ball in play is infinitely times better, obviously, than striking out. Hard hit, soft hit, bunt, it doesn't matter. Putting the ball in play is unequivocally better than a strikeout in any spot. And it just feels like the Mariners kind of lack that that instinct up there at the plate to even just like get some wood on it when there's guys on base because you never know what's going to happen. You don't know where the ball is going to go. You don't know what the fielders are going to do. There's the the air of unknown where it doesn't matter how hard it is, how hard it's hit. You put the ball in play and good things might happen. Good things might happen. This game sucked. This game was terrible. This game, I I pride myself on not taking baseball results very hard because there's 162 games in a season, and if you take every loss as, oh, man, this team stinks, like, I'm sad now. I don't know how you get through the whole season of baseball. I, But this one, this late in the season this much on the line and the game goes like this because it's baseball and it's stupid sometimes this one hurt this one really hurt 
on a Saturday too. It's it was a good reminder that ever to everyone that baseball is dumb. Baseball is often dumb. Baseball is pretty luck based. But sometimes the great teams can make their own luck. And I mean this Mariners team is not great. They're a good team. They're a good team, but I don't Sometimes the baseball gods just uh, demand you lose a game. And then the game today. And then the game today happens. And Brian Wu's on the mound, which already made me a little hesitant going in because he uh, has not had a very good time down in Texas this season. And it didn't go great. It didn't go great. He gave up six runs. He gave up four home runs, which was his... uh, he hadn't given up more than three in a game this season so far. I can't even say he looked that terrible. Uh, he lacked a little command and was putting guys on, but his stuff was still pretty good. And really, it was like what I said earlier, it was the Rangers taking advantage of those mistake pitches. He left a couple fastballs in the zone and... Marcus Semyon, Corey Seager, they took advantage of that. They were really good at doing that today because sometimes you can make mistakes. I mean, look at the Mike Montgomery. Mike Montgomery, whoa. Wrong Montgomery. The Jordan Montgomery start last night. He made uh, plenty of mistakes with his fastball in the zone, and our, our hitters were on it, and they didn't fall for hits. And Brian Wu makes a decent amount of mistakes in today's game with his fastball, and they're in the seats. You know, sometimes that's the difference. And they lose today and get swept. They get swept in probably what was the biggest series of the year until this point. At least they didn't fold. Say what you will about this team, but it's clear again that they don't they don't quit, you know. They were down by quite a lot of runs in this one. And they came back to make it competitive. They they came back and they lost nine to eight because they they made Eovaldi work. They got to the bullpen. They were putting good swings on the ball. They were putting balls in the outfield with runners on base, and they come up just short uh, because the Rangers put too many runs on the board. And you know what's funny? Julio Rodriguez hit a home run today, but oh, he hit it with his glove, and he was playing defense. If you didn't watch today's game, which if you're listening to this, I imagine you probably did or was following it to a certain capacity, uh, but it ends up being the difference maker. Uh, Julio Rodriguez tracking back on a ball that's hit really well. He jumps to get it, bang, right off his glove over the fence. That is the type of series that it was. At the time, it was just piling on, and then you look back and it's like, oh, they came back. How many did they lose by? Oh, one run? What could have been the difference there? There's, you can point to a lot of differences, obviously. They could have, I mean, there were a lot of offensive things that they didn't take advantage of despite getting eight runs. But you look back and it's like, well, the the difference was a solo, was a home run. was one run. And it was a home run that Julio Rodriguez had in his glove and it bounced out over the wall. That's just how this whole series went. That was emblematic of the weekend and regardless of of how well they played, I don't think they were going to come out on top this series. It just felt like they were going to lose. The It's felt like that against the Rangers this year. Every game has just felt like they are more talented. Uh, and they, they are, maybe. I mean, they're, they're offenses, at least. And it showed that sometimes best offense can, can zap good pitching. It was unfortunate how this lined up. With pitching staff, though, I mean, you had Logan going, which was good, but you had Bryce Miller and Brian Wu both in Texas, and that going into it, going into the series, was like, oh, that's a little risky, and they both give up a fair amount of runs, and you lose both the games they start. Uh, just didn't quite line up correctly, unfortunately. Uh, you get you get your your boys versus the Astros though, which is good. You get Kirby and Luis at least to start that series, but it's quite deflating seeing what happened this week, and it 
is even worse because it puts the Rangers in such a good position. And considering how poor they've played against the Rangers this year and they have four more games against them, it's just there's a lot of reasons to be filled with dread right now. And I'm not. I'm still optimistic, baby. We're a half game back of the Astros. There's not out of it at all. And anything could happen. There's a week's worth of baseball. They're three back of the Rangers, a half game back of the Astros. That's still not really that bad of a spot to be in, considering you play those teams. Like, the the rest of the season is in their hands. It is entirely up to how the team plays right now. Entirely up to how they play. And they they hold their own destiny. I mean, it's... It's not like they're going to have to hope the Rangers lose when they play these Astros. But like right now, it's just uh, they got to just win against divisional opponents to win the division or go to the wild card. It's just it's an uphill battle after going to Texas and laying an absolute egg. <sighs> just unfortunate. Twitter was a goddamn war zone this weekend. God, People are so lazy on there. It's just Scott this, Scott that. It's Scott's fault. Why do you do that? So lazy. Blame someone else, you know? Blame blame whatever God you pray to. Blame, I don't know, capitalism. Bl- blame John Stan. I don't even care. I, if you're going to blindly blame Scott for w- things that... Really, he does not have 100% control over. Just blame John Stan. Like, at least do some good with your Twitter account. And a lot of people were saying this weekend, it's like, well, luck, luck doesn't matter if you're playing bad. It's like, it kind of does. I mean, they were playing poorly, but they lost by three, two, and one run. They, the Rangers didn't play exceptionally well this series. They played marginally better than the Mariners, and they got a lot of breaks. That's how stupid baseball is. You look at how lucky you can get, and the Mariners win one or two of these games if a couple breaks go their way. It's pretty simple. Like, it's it's not using luck as a crutch. Like, if they were more lucky, they would have won. Who knows what would have happened? The fact was they were so unlucky that it's impossible to know, and they lost regardless. It's just, I think people on Twitter are tired, and uh, they're just running back the same hits of Blame Scott. I've been tweeting out a lot of stuff for funsies blaming Scott, and I think it's ac- it's actually really fun. I see why they do it, because you can just say, hey, Scott, why'd you do this, and everything is solved. Uh, but that was the Rangers series. It was terrible. Uh, what, a, what an awful time. <laughs> an awful time. Luckily, though, the Kansas City Royals marched into Houston and swept the Astros at home. Hell yeah. The saving grace of this weekend was the Astros got swept by the Royals. The Royals, the the most chaotic team that the Mariners have played this year. The Mariners play six games. It feels like we played them for two months. The Mariners end up taking five of six of those games as W's, which thank you, Royals, you made games so stressful, but gave the Mariners the wins anyway. And then you march into Houston after, the, like, while the Mariners are getting swept in the same state and do the Mariners a favor and sweep the Astros. Tremendous. Just tremendous stuff. I, the Astros, I've said it for the last couple of weeks, they were in first for a little while. And I think I've been saying, like, I'm just, like, I've resigned myself that the Astros are making the playoffs. I We haven't really seen them in a while not make the playoffs. We haven't seen them falter this late in the year in quite some time. Because they're the Astros. We just know they're going to put it together. But they're floundering. They were floundering before the Royals series. They were not playing very good baseball last week. And they followed up this week being swept by the Royals. And now the Mariners, who aren't playing great ball... They're playing okay ball, not great ball. And the Astros, who are just downright playing bad right now, they clash. A half game separates them, and they clash. A sweep 
almost dusts the other opponent. A sweep on either side. If the Mariners sweep them, it's potentially bye-bye Astros. If the Astros sweep the Mariners, it's almost undoubtedly bye-bye Mariners for the year. Unless the Rangers get swept, I guess. Uh, I am nervous. I am so nervous for this series. I am officially dubbing it the most important series of the year. I dubbed the Oakland A's series last week as the most important of the year, and it was. And they handled business. But now, a new series has taken up the mantle of importance, and it's Houston versus Seattle. I, I'm i not going to talk about it anymore. The more I think about it, the more stress I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become. And this episode is going to come out a few hours before the first game against the Astros. And, uh, or it's not in Houston. I think I said it was in Houston. It's at home. Mariners are at home there this year, thankfully. Uh, but it's, 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 it's time. It's time for the chaos to reign. It's time for the Mariners to put on their big boy hats and gut out a series win against the Astros. They've been really good against the Astros this year. They've got to build on it. Because the Rangers go to the Angels. Can the Angels do something fantastic? Can the Angels do it? I'm putting zero faith in the Angels. If they win one game, that is a W in my book. Uh, But that is what's been going on with the Mariners. You know what's going on. I'm not going to talk anymore about the Rangers. I'm not going to talk about the Astros anymore. All I want to talk about right now is Luis Castillo. Luis Castillo has recorded... Five plus innings in all 31 of his starts this season, which is the most in Major League Baseball. He's also gone six innings in 22 of his outings, 18 of those being quality starts. The man has been the ace this year. I've entertained George Kirby being better than him, but the past month has cemented that Luis Castillo is the ace, like we all thought. He is that guy. He is absolutely that guy. And They couldn't manage to win any games he started for the first half of the year, and they've won like the last 10 he started. So it's kind of equalized. And going five innings in every start you pitch the year, especially when he's uh, pitched 31 starts, which is, I mean, he's thrown about as many innings as you can in this modern, modern era this season. That's an absolute horse at the top of your rotation that we absolutely love to see. Uh, Because... You don't have to go out there and toss a quality start, but five innings is five innings goes a long way. Uh, it's crazy to think that is nothing for a starter, like even like 15 years ago. Uh, but going five innings, especially with the way he pitches, which sometimes he throws a lot of pitches, he has a tendency to have a 30 or 40 pitch inning from time to time. And he still guts out and goes five in every start. That was honestly surprising he's done that. Uh, and that is really impressive. And I wanted to say that here. Shout out to Luis Castillo. Another thing I wanted to highlight before I get into Thai France. The Modesto Nuts. They won the California League uh, this weekend. Hell yeah. Go Nuts. I think I talked about them a couple weeks ago. They rattled off like a 15-game win streak. Uh, it was a collection of... It was maybe it was one of the more special collections of Mariners hitting hitting prospects I've ever seen in my lifetime. Uh, they won the California League. Uh, Colt Emerson had a walk off, I think, in Game One of that championship series. They just they swept the playoffs. They went thirty eight and nine over their last forty seven games. They were a wagon, a wagon for the last month and a half of the season. And it's a really big bright spot in the organization because it was on the backs of, like I said, like four or five uh, top hitting prospects in the org. Just super impressive, super awesome. Shout out to one of the best mascots in baseball, the Nuts. And uh, fantastic, fantastic stuff from Modesto Nuts. Love to see it. And now I want to get into a little Ty France talk. Ty France has been not great. Uh, There's been a lot of discourse on Twitter, especially in the past couple weeks, as uh, it's been more dramatic. The games have mattered more, and as Ty France gets out more, people on Twitter turn turn to hate the man. And I don't necessarily blame them. It's been a super lackluster year from him this season. Uh, Pretty disappointing. 
and I know why. I've diagnosed the issue. The issue is power. He's just not socking as many balls as hard. No, there's, there's, I'm sure there's so many issues. I'm sure it's layered. Uh, I think it might even go back to the injury he had last year. Um, his hitting stance is a little bit different this year, but I'm not going to talk about his stance. I'm going to leave that to the experts. There's a lot of talk, like I said, about potentially non-tendering Ty Francis offseason. I, I don't even know if that's the right move, but I wouldn't blame them if they did that. Uh, they, for those of you who don't know, they could offer him a contract on arbitration this year, or they could just not and he becomes a free agent outright, you can just not offer a guy a contract. That's how it works. And it's going to be complicated to see what they actually do this offseason with him. But I've taken a look at his numbers um, because watching him this year and even seeing people talk about him online, you'd think he's been the worst player in the league this season. I think it's more expectation-based, the disappointment this year because he's been pretty pretty Ty France like this season. It's it's his his st- his stuff hasn't changed a whole lot this year. It's the expected stuff and then some things that he's swinging at that has changed. So his K rate this year is eighteen percent. That is like two points higher than last season. His walk rate is up like a point. So that's not really a huge change there. He still manages to to not strike out. He that's pretty well below league average, uh, and a little below league average walk rate. But he he's a contact guy. He's he's an average hitter, but he's hitting two fifty this year. And you look at his expected batting average this season. It's two sixty six, which you know that's still whatever. His expected last year is two sixty two, and then you look at his expected slugging this season is 408 and it was 397 last year so 408 expected slug this year 397 expected slug last year and then you look at his raw slugging last year it was 437 and this year it's 358 his isolated power is down from 162 last season to 109 this year so at face value you look at Ty France and you look at you can even you can look at so many other stats that validate he's been a very similar player. You look at his pull percentage, his straight on percentage, like where he's hitting the ball. It's not being distributed that differently. He's pulling the ball slightly more this season. He's hitting the ball at the straightaway center slightly more. He has slightly more weak contact, but also he is barreling balls at a higher rate per play appearance than last year. He is still hitting the ball at a rate that he was last season. His hard hit rate is up from last season, actually. It was 36.8% last season. It's 38.6% this season. And so you look at it, and it's like, hmm, kind of a mystery. He's hitting for less power, but his expected stats are essentially the same, if not better, than last season. He's still making a good amount of contact. He's still barreling the ball. He's barreling the ball more than last season, a season in which he hit the ball pretty well. He had 20 home runs last year, following up 18 from 2021. He's got 10 on the season this year. Only 10. Somehow still 101 WRC+. Positive player at the plate. Not on the base box, but at the plate. So... I looked at all of this, and I was like, why? What is happening? It has to be something with his swing. He's clearly gotten a little unlucky, but unlucky is different when you're talking about home runs. You can't get unlucky and hit 10 less home runs. Like, I don't think you could get that unlucky. And thanks (laughs) thanks to Baseball Savant, my next... My next little thought was, oh, I'll just go look at his plate discipline. Because his raw stats didn't tell me a whole lot of what he's doing differently this year. It's because he's not doing stuff differently. You go to his plate discipline, oh man, it hasn't changed that much. His zone swing percentage is within 
uh, two percent, two two points of last year. His his zone contact, same thing. His chase rate is up slightly, but only like one point. He is swinging at the first pitch roughly the same as he did last time. He's whiffing slightly more, which goes in line with his two percent bump in K rate. He's swinging at pitches right down the middle, uh, uh, the same amount essentially from last year. And then oh. I found it. You go to the swing take section of Baseball Savant, and this tells you there's four quadrants that they've divided the plate into, and it tells you how many like run value they create by where each of these pitches are. So the four quadrants are the heart, the shadow, the chase, and the waist. So the heart is just a square kind of right in the middle of the strike zone. The shadow is everything... It's kind of the edges of the strike zone and the edges of just outside the strike zone. So pitches on the fringe, that's the shadow region. The chase region is a, is a couple inches out from that. And then the waist region is a couple inches out from that. So those are super non-competitive pitches. On waist pitches this year, he's generated 12 run value from that, 12 runs. His chase region this year, 15 run value. So he's laying off the pitches he's supposed to be laying off. And then you go to the heart and the shadow. The shadow region, again, this is the fringes of the strike zone and just outside of the strike zone. Minus 24 runs this year from the shadow region of pitches. It was minus 6 last season, which tells me he is swinging at more pitches in that region and not making good contact. He's striking out more on those pitches. Maybe he's not swinging as much at those pitches, but he's... His edge swing rate is slightly higher, so if anything, he's swinging at more pitches in that range. The biggest difference, I think, is the heart section of this uh, statistic. You look at it, and again, this is pitches in a square quadrant that's kind of right in the center, in the heart of the plate. It's a decent area of the strike zone. Minus eight runs on pitches in that area of the strike zone this year. That is the biggest difference for me. Last year it was one run value, and two years ago it was 12 in the heart of the plate. And I think that tells me why he hasn't been hitting as many home runs. I think he's just doing so much less with pitches in the center of the plate this year. Because I've never... we Ty France is not one to take a high and outside pitch to the opposite field for a home run. He's not really one to dig out a pitch at his shins for a home run like Julio can do. He's a guy who's punished predominantly bad breaking balls in the middle of the plate for home runs. He just simply has not done that this year, and this stat tells me that. And I think that's where a lot of this runs. So I think he's been unlucky, but I also just think he's just not doing much with pitches in the middle of the plate, which is bad. As a hitter, you want to at least do really big damage on those pitches. And Savant is amazing. Baseball Savant's fantastic. Because you go into this stat more, and they have a lovely visual for me. And his swing percentage on those pitches is 78%. It's 5% more than league average. And that is, I mean, it's he swings at more pitches than the average major league player. So that makes sense. It's that those have manifested into negative 24 swinging runs. So he's he, it's not that he's not identifying good pitches to swing at. I think his eye and his plate discipline are perfectly fine. I think they're still better than the average hitter. But negative 24 swinging runs from pitches in the heart of the plate is so bad. That means he's doing shit all with pitches in the center of the plate. And I think that is where those, why those power numbers have taken such a hit. Those are, those are ones you got to put in the seats or hit into the gap really hard. And he's just not doing it. And I think that is the big difference of his season. Uh, You look at it and you look at the shadow region. He has negative 12 swinging runs from that region too. And he has actually a positive plus one take runs so when he's taking in the shadow region it's been slightly positive this season which means again he's probably laying off pitches close to the zone that are balls which is good it's that's so bad this was this was eye-opening to me because again the story by 
the eye test is he's just been bad. And the story by the stats is that, yes, he has been worse than last year and the year before, but I don't even think the process is that changed. It's just he's doing jack with pitches in the middle of the plate. His swing does look slightly different than last season. Uh, I think he's a little bit more closed off than he was last year. Uh, His front foot is when he's starting his swing. But I don't even know what the deal is here. I don't know if it's a swing change that needs to be done. I don't know if he's just getting supremely unlucky with these pitches that he's hitting uh, in in the heart of the plate. That is crazy. I am going to, tomorrow when this podcast comes out, before the game, probably post this graphic on Twitter uh, with a link to the podcast as well, because I've talked about it. But it's kind of crazy to to see how bad he's really been with, with pitches in the center of the plate. Uh, and I think it's as simple as that. I think he has 10 less home runs because he's just he's just not hitting meatballs out at a rate he should be this season. Uh, and that is, there's definitely more that goes into it, but that is what I think is the main issue here, and it's really weird. I don't even know how to handle the offseason with him. I'm leaning to not non-tender him. After looking at these stats, I think there's changes to be made, and I think he could still be a pretty good player next year. That's probably, right now, an unpopular take amongst Mariners fans, but I think non-tendering him is a mistake. Because the alternative at the moment, unless they trade for Pete Alonso, is like, I don't know, you could give Jake Shiner some run. I still wouldn't rely on AAA stats as heavily as a lot of people. Uh, you could re-sign Mike Ford. Hope he can recapture the Mike Ford magic next season. Uh, you can aggressively promote Tyler Locklear to play first. He's been hitting really well in the minors and AA and uh, with uh, the Aqua Sox earlier this season. I I just I wouldn't I would extend an arb offer to Ty France and at the end of the day, if he is a guy who can come off the bench, play good defensive first base, you know, provide decent value in the DH spot and not have to play every day, I don't think that's really a bad thing. I feel like that's still better than their alternative in terms of depth. Uh, so my official stance right now is don't non-tender Ty France. Actually extend an offer to him. And I don't know. The The problem with that is if they pay him like $6 million next year or something like that, is that too rich for John Stanton's blood to want to go out and get another first baseman? Like if they, it's with the caveat. My my opinion is with a caveat of they shouldn't non-tender Ty France. They should give him an offer. But with the caveat of they sh- that shouldn't be like, okay, we have our first baseman for next year. That should be, we should still improve the position. Because we're allowed to pay millions of dollars for more players in the offseason. I just don't know if that's really the mindset of the top uh, ownership of the Mariners, unfortunately. And that makes me sad. But that's my Ty France takes. I hope uh, you should go look at these numbers. And then I'll post that graph too. It's just really interesting how it's shaken out this season for him. Uh, I, I hope... If you had just gone into this and was listening to this podcast thinking Ty France has just been really bad this season, a little bit of that. But I I think people are being so hard on the man, and I think, honestly, uh, he has not been as bad as the eye test or even the raw stats say, unfortunately. Uh, it's just sometimes baseball screws you. And maybe it is his fault. He's not hitting those pitches well or... Maybe he's gotten super unlucky, and and maybe, again, it's just a swing tweak that could get him back to to barreling those out of the park. I just, I don't know. It's just weird. But that is how I diagnose Ty France and his hitting woes. Um, Hope he can get back on track, because I like Ty. I just like him as a person. He seems like a a fun, very nice fella, Uh, and it's got to be, if it's tough on the fans watching him, it's got to be tough for him also especially if he knows that he's not hitting pitches in the middle of the zone well, which I'm sure he knows that. I'm sure the organization knows that. That's really tough. Uh, But that's it. That's what I have to say about Ty France. And before we run really long, my random weekly notes, they're short this week. Um, The first one is Cal Raleigh photo shoot at Dick's. And then that led me to whole team photo shoot at Dick's. And that led me to a Mariner's calendar, but all the photos 
are of individual players for each of the 12 months, all shot at Dick's Burgers. Uh, this was inspired by uh, UW football. Shout out to UW football. Absolute wagon of an offense this season, of a team this season. Maybe the best team in the country. Uh, they had a little photo shoot of some of the offense, I think, at Dick's. And it was awesome. It looked sick. Uh, and I guess I guess if you're if you're listening to this and you don't know what Dick's Burgers is, I I don't know how to help you. I feel like if you're listening to this, you know what Dick's Burgers is. So look it up if you don't. I guess Seattle staple. Uh, but the whole team should do a photo shoot at Dick's. And the calendar idea. So my mind went to a calendar, but it also went to like a car wash calendar where all the players are like, you know, they're not naked, but they're they're tastefully nude in this photo shoot at Dick's, uh, which is works on many levels and also would just be fantastic if the whole team did a photo shoot at Dick's regardless. So uh, Mariners marketing, Mariners PR, get on that. My next note, which I actually touched on earlier, the A's offense has been pretty uh, entertaining somewhat the past like month. I think I might just like watching prospects try to hit at the major league level more than most people. Uh, I think it's also because there's just an unknown future of how truly good these guys will be. So, like, with every home run or hard hit they have, it's like, holy man, they might be really good. You get to hope. You get to forge their future in your head while watching. My next weekly note, what if every MLB stadium was like the Coliseum in foul territory, like total area? So what if there was a mandated... MLB wide rule that your your foul ball, your foul territory area had to be the same as the Coliseum. Imagine how chaotic that would make baseball. That would be awesome. Imagine the sweet plays you could get. Uh, that is all for that one. Just imagining crazy MLB stadiums. And my last note is a question. My last note is uh, a question for maybe Blue Jays fans, but broader baseball fans. Is you say Kikuchi a cat or a dog even it was revealed he didn't have a great start a few days ago and he said well i didn't get great sleep last night i only slept 11 hours usually i sleep 13 to 14 what brother if i get more than like eight and a half or nine hours of sleep i feel like garbage i how does he sleep that much to be fair it's only on days he starts. So he gets 13 or 14 hours of sleep the night before he starts a baseball game. And that's not really one of the weirdest pitcher things out there because pitchers are so weird. But 13 or 14 hours, I don't even think if I tried, I could sleep that long. It's cr- It was so out of pocket to hear someone say, yeah, I just didn't get great sleep last night. I only, I only got a solid 11 Good God, man. Like, is he a cat? That's wild to me. I just wanted to, t- I just wanted to touch on that real quick. Uh, but that's it for my weekly notes. Uh, we're running a little long here. I appreciate if you're listening this far. Again, this is the 50th episode. It's been an absolute pleasure doing this. I don't plan on stopping. For all you haters out there, I don't plan on stopping doing this. I'm going to go into the off season. I'm going to regroup. I'm going to come out next year hot. But 50 episodes, that's a milestone. I'm going to celebrate it, and you should too. Uh, but appreciate y'all listening this far. If you are listening this far, obviously, the the normal uh, yeah, rate and review, do whatever you want. Go, go to your local church and scream out during gospel that the Chaos Ball podcast just hit their 50th episode. That's what I want you to do. But the Mariners, everyone pray that the Mariners have a good week. Ugh, God, they they have the Astros for three games at home, and then they have the Rangers for four games at home. And I record on Sundays, and they have their final game of the season, I believe, on a Monday. Let me just double-check that so I'm not making an ass of myself here. Their final game of the season... Oh, no, it's on a Sunday. Okay, so their final game of the season is on a Sunday. I will be recording after that game no matter what happens. So, tune in next week for a... Oh, my God, the range of emotions that could be shown in that episode is wild. It's it's broad. Uh, but 
I'm recording no matter what happens. So let's hope it's a happy episode next week. But but with that, I'll leave you with uh, hope you have a good rest of your week. And of course, for hopefully not the last time this season, go Mariners. <laughs>